Thank you for the quick introduction. Um, so what I do on a day to day is that uh, I'm a programmer um, at a company called Consensus. I've been there now for about four years. And more specifically, I'm working on a project called Uja Music, which is trying to make musicians more money by utilizing some of these technologies in new ways. Many of you might here be more familiar with a lot of writing that I've done around curation markets and things like bonding curves that Fang just introduced and spoke about. Uh, but today I just want to touch upon some new interesting e explorations which is has been introduced by people like Glenn that have just allowed us to think broader about what the arts could look like and how we could fund the arts and how we could reimagine what the new creative economy could look like. So. As we all know, this is fairly clear, we've all been moved by a piece of art, whether it's a book, an artwork, a movie, or a song. And so we all realize that the arts have extreme value to us in society. And I think this question is becoming increasingly more important when we think about the fact that we might be increasingly moving into what would be regarded as a post-automation world, and thus a lot of what we will do in society will be only our creative output. Um, and we, we have started doing that already to a very large extent. What we call the knowledge economy is a creative economy, right? It's not dependent on your hard labor to put things into a conveyor belt. It is your creative output that produces value. With that, there's even other, other options um, and examples that exist where we also see creative output being done, but we don't necessarily see that in a classical sense, right? We don't see that as we are generating art or artwork and that is things like you know we're just tweeting like you're c contributing to the cultural commons by tweeting by editing a wikipedia page by posting a photo that you just took on instagram by <laughs> contributing and working together with people we are producing creative output but we are not necessarily being rewarded to the extent that we feel like these are valuable contributions to society, right? So a lot of these questions that I've been trying to answer is trying to answer the problem of the creators. How do we allow creators to create more? Because if we realize that where the world is going, we it's also solving the problem of more people in society, not just those who wish to create. You know, we've, we're all going to become creators. So solving these problems are hard, and not just because it's going to be issues that's becoming more prevalent, but art is great. You know, it's, it's as old as humans themselves, and it's always been value for us in terms of making connections with people. I always use the example of um, art and music um, in describing, in, in it being some form of language, right? If you go to a gig to watch your favorite band, it is substantially easier there to just talk to people and ask them, what's your favorite album? Where are you from? What do you do, right? Because that context provides you a way to connect to people. So that's why it's valuable. And that's why I've been trying to work on these problems for the past few years. So in this talk, I just want to talk about some of the, the ideas that Glenn proposed that tries to question how we can relate to the arts, to intellectual property ownership, and how we can maybe use some of the ad these ideas to fund the arts in new ways. So one of the, the in, in the, the original paper about property rights and um, called uh, property is only another name for monopoly, if I have it correct, yeah. It also delineates between the concept of natural capital, which is things like, you know, um, land and um, things we can touch and feel. And then there's artificial capital, which is the things we invent. And the question around artificial capital is like, if we use some of these models for intellectual property ownership, what should the turnover rates be? And I'll talk, talk, talk about that later. But one of the things that we realize in intellectual property as, a, as um, opposed to more so in the real world, so in the real world, we understand that there's private property and there are things like the commons, like a, a local park or a pasture. Um, but perhaps in intellectual property, we are more familiar with the idea that things should be owned in common, right? And that, that even exists bef existed before the internet came around. You know, uh, the concept that copyright expires. Um, until recently, it was a bit less, but in most countries, there's a 50 to 100 year time frame that when the original creator of the copyright dies, the copyright becomes accessible in the public domain. Certainly, we all know that patents expire after a while, so we are familiar th of the idea with the concept that intellectual property should not remain forever limited to be exploited by specific people. It should eventually become part of a global commons 
and access. So it's not that these ideas are unfamiliar in the space. In more to the traditional realm of these, this kind of intellectual property ownership, it still pr presents somewhat interesting ideas in the case of should we perhaps experiment with intellectual property ownership that has these form of rights. You know, is the concept of how, how do we measure that uh, it's, it's, it's like um, collectively beneficial for society that copyright expires 70 years after someone has died. Can we measure that there's perhaps an, eff uh, an effective outcome where you say intellectual property should act like this way, thus it produces collective benefit to society. That's perhaps where something like Michael's work could be useful in modeling and understanding when is a good time for intellectual property to be commons owned. But perhaps there's alternative ways. Perhaps we never think of th that you think should become public dom domain. Perhaps we should follow the cost model, which is it could be forever exportable in private property, but there's always a tax on doing so if the, if the intellectual property remains proprietary or privately owned, right? So, you know, one of the concept that, I put the Mickey Mouse here because cop copyright extensions are quite familiar by the fact that Disney has continuously lobbied to extend the copyright of Mickey Mouse. But what if, you know, Mickey Mouse as a brand could be bought from Disney if you felt that you could more effectively produce Mickey Mouse cartoons or brand or mer merchandise. And these are things that could be possible in this domain. It is perhaps not, th there's still an outstanding question about how would hard it would be to implement this because um, in sense, like if you have defined real estate, it, it's easier to start to tell to someone, yes, someone bought your property, you have to vacate it. But if someone buys Mickey Mouse from Disney, then it would be quite hard to go to Disney and take out all the Mickey Mouse artwork and cartoons and whatever. So it's a bit harder to implement in practice. But um, it does have some current implementations in traditional space, which is um, what we're all familiar with in the open source space is that we have licensing schemes which are um, supposed to be um, for the community and for society. You know, permissive uh, licensing schemes are examples of that. We put it in the public domain to be used by anyone and you have to keep using that license or other forms of licensing. So um, there was an interesting proposal recently by Luke Duncan which proposed that um, we could keep this model, right? But instead of having this framework that we want to force people to not fork something, fork code and use it for proprietary reasons, let's allow them to do that. But once they do that, they have to then pay tax to keep the code proprietary, right? So that is a very great model, I feel like, to say, like, listen, you're always welcome to take something out of the commons once it exists in the commons, you can fork it, make a derivative, but then you keep paying a tax to keep keep it that way. And uh, s then in that case, someone can buy it from you um, for their own personal use in exploiting that for private reasons. Or in that scenario, someone could say, you know what, there is a fund where people can go and buy rights to put it into the public domain. Um, and then this would be good models where people can then use this tax to fund creative commons endeavors. Like if this tax is then used to fund more creative work and more commons, that would facilitate and buffet the potential for code to be remain open source. Similarly, in the media space, we, we are familiar with Creative Commons, where you, where you write or release music under the Creative Commons licenses, which is permissive for people to reuse and remix it in various ways. And this could work in a similar way. I publish a song. Someone can take the song, make a remix. Feel free to do whatever you want with it. You can make as much money as, as you want from it. As long as you feel like you want to keep it private property, you have to pay the tax towards the Creative Commons. Um, I put the I put the, f the examples of the Rolexes in here, and I actually really can't remember <laughs> why I did that. Um, but I thought it was interesting to make an example that intellectual property is also sometimes valuable, not because of what it does, but also because of by its association. You know, a real Rolex will always be worth more than a fake Rolex, no matter how it looks like. And a signed CD from a band will always be worth more than a non-signed CD, if you uh, remember what a CD is. <laughs> um, so these there's are interesting ideas in the current sort of space of intellectual property ownership, and I want to start touching more on what we, what, what could be new in terms of new kinds of intellectual property. Um, but before I get there, um, we're all familiar with the concept of collecting, right? We're all 
you know, we all v have bought band merch and wear wore it proudly. Um, we are familiar with people that tried that hoard Star Wars memorabilia. There's interesting questions about what value that could provide, not just only for the creators of that work, but also for what it could mean for the fans when that kind of memorabilia or collectibleness had that kind of model of property rights ownership. You know, in the sense that once you have a piece of memorabilia, you value it to the extent that you feel like you want to keep that. And once you do, you pay a tax to the creators of that work, right? So that creates a new way, a new form of patronage where you say, I'll support you by paying this tax by keeping a collectible, right? I feel I deserve this memorabilia and through that I can support the artist in a new way. That is obviously quite hard to do with physical merchandise, but that's where things get interesting with the blockchain in terms of issuing new kinds of collectibles but then encoding these property rights and schemes and patronage automatically inside these collectibles. So for those that don't know, I think this room would be fairly familiar with it, but everyone knows what a crypto kitty is. It's cats on the blockchain. Um, <laughs> the interesting question around a lot of these new non-fungible tokens or collectibles is that what if we could reimagine how the property rights of these collectibles work and through their process fund not just the creators of the software, but also the creators of the art? You know, that cute crypto kitty right there, what if the artist who created that could have some form of subsistence payments or patronage by, by doing so? But it's not only that. Blockchain technology itself re has reduced the barrier to entry to create digital collectibles to such an extent that it's almost zero cost for me to keep it because this infrastructure is paying for it, right? So yes, I have some CryptoKitties I bought in December. They're doing nothing right now, just sitting in the blockchain, minding their own business. But someone could say, hey, like your traits in your CryptoKitty, like, like you're not breeding with those cats. Like, can I take them? And that should be the case. It's just like, take my cats. Like, feel free to take them, right? <laughs> and breed with them, right? So. But what's interesting about these models is just it would uh, it would not just allow for better allocation of these things, like allow the top 20% of the fans who play CryptoKitties to make the most of the arc, the system, not necessarily the people on the edges of the network or the game that just sort of stumbled into CryptoKitties and go like, I bought some and I don't care anymore. Um, but it would also allow them to support the creators of the software and the works. And another version of the, this that we're doing with um, which our music is experimenting with badges and collectibles. Uh, but we're sort of slowly moving towards that sense. But what's doubly interesting with digital collectibles, especially the blockchain, is that you create a provenance of ownership which is in, in itself valuable for the owners of that collectibles. So even if you bought the collectible and someone bought it from you, you still have the, that immutable trace that is left in the blockchain that says you were a holder at some point in time. And that is equally as valuable as just actually holding it. So in a sense, you get to the point where the turnover of the asset could become the goal itself. And that is uh, a model I designed called rare patronage, which is you have the idea that a musician has this one seat available and you would then essentially self-assess the value of the seat. And when you, s when you assess the value of the seat, you pay a patronage fee to the artist. And your goal for doing that is saying, I'm the supporter, look at me world, I'm the supporter of this amazing artist. And once your, um, your seat is stolen from you by a new better fan, you, said you will then essentially get access to a post-patron club, like you were a patron. So these are some interesting ideas in which we can experiment with these kind of property rights and ownership by having the ability to encode some forms of scarcity. Then there's also another interesting ways in which the act itself could be seen as art or games. So uh, one idea I came up with called the, the Harberger pixel map, um, which is, as we all know, the million dollar homepage. We have all the pixels there and people can place it. Uh, similarly, the Reddit had one called the place. And there are versions in Bitcoin as well that exist that do this. But this version is essentially saying every pixel has that form of property rights, which is once you own it, you can set the color and you have to price it, someone else can buy it from you. And so f in, that, in that way, people can buy like allocations of the artwork, make something new with it and set the value on the price 
and in, in that process, by collectively creating that artwork, you're, you can fund the people who are making that artwork. Like everyone involved makes, makes money. Um, I, I was, there's another thing I came up with called autonomous, which is essentially an autonomous artist. I won't go into de too detail about that, but essentially a bot that sells generative art, right? And so it would create art like every day and then people could buy and sell the art. But similarly, if you kept that art in this property rights method, the tax would go to the autonomous artist and that tax could then be used to incentivize people to produce new generative artwork. So in a sense, you get the same thing where the turnover as a forcing function creates digital artwork. And this could be done in new different ways as well. What if you're writing a collective book and if you're the o current owner of the book, you can write the story, right? And as long as you can keep writing the story, someone else can come and buy it from you and, and continue working with it. Uh, an example of this, we, we can actually see in a company called Dada.nyc where they do visual artwork in this style. Like a person starts off, creates a piece of work. The next person comes and says, I'm gonna add to the work. So they draw a similar thing, but you can take this and reimagine it this way. So there's a lot of interesting ways to explore it. Um, so these are like basic themes just from the, the chapter on uh, heartbreaker tax and a cost ownership model. Uh, but there's other interesting examples that we also can consider, which is somewhat unexplored at this stage, but I, but I do want to find time to talk about it and, and um, explore it in new ways. Um, as we all know, data as labor is, is something that is covered quite extensively in the book. Um, for me, it's important also to consider not just the, the, the value that you're providing in terms of using it for machine learning in Instagram or Facebook, but you know, you are, if you're posting a photo on Instagram, it is, it, it is not just about the social value. It is still generating financial value for Instagram. So to what extent does your photograph can be used to actually um, own that uh, or create money from it? And what about memes, right? Like we all participate in this collective meme world and uh, Billy and others created um, using um, curation markets, created an app called Meme Lords where you buy and sell memes, right? Um, so that's also interesting ways to explore it. There's a picture of it that there in the bottom. Um, other questions from the book uh, around the proceeds from migration sponsorship could be art, right? We don't necessarily have to expect that the proceeds should be financial. Um, to what extent have we questioned an antitrust in the creative industries? There are three big record labels. The right, uh, put them the wrong thing there. It should be Warner is the other one, not BMI. And BMI is a other kind of institution. But to what extent should we question antitrust in the music industry when three labels have almost 60% of all recording rights in, in, in popular music? What about things like quantitative voting in playlists? You know, What if your band comes to your town and that town really loves this awkward B-side on like a single EP that was released 10 years ago and they really wanna hear that live, right? That could be used there. What is, however, the, hard, the, the hardest thing in this space, especially intellectual property, is that it does require legal innovation, which is really hard to do. Uh, I've often thought about um, this idea that because it's so hard and you're constantly bumping intellectual property laws that are different all across the world, copyright schemes that are different, that there could be a model where people just say, you know what, I'm relinquishing all my rights in the meat space, right? For all intents and purposes, my intellectual property is now public domain, but then you opt into a new way, a, a new sort of court or arbitration s or dispute system that is mediated by blockchain technology. And then finally, something I didn't, haven't covered in this topic, but what might you might be familiar with is you know, concepts like curve bonding and curation markets that could facilitate new forms of art creation and facilitation. Um, penultimate slide um, covers questions around you know at all these circumstances where we have these kind of new property rights for intellectual property to what extent or to in what way should the tax be div divided right because the traditional one is to say yes give it to the government and they can decide what to do with it but that doesn't feel like necessarily the best outcome for everyone involved so to me what I feel is that there should rather be many self-organizing opt-in 
tax, tax regimes, so to speak, where the creators of the artwork sets a license in such extent that they define where the tax should be paid, or at least present certain options of where the tax should be paid, right? Whether it's to the Creative Commons organization, or whether it's to say like the current owner of the work, or like the previous owner, or like wh whatever is possible. There's many ways in which that could be redistrib redistributed um, that incentivizes that specific community. Um, another question which is in, in artificial capital is the question of turnover rates. Because intellectual property is substantially broader and heterogeneous, there's very different ways which you can define turnover rates. And for the most part, it's, it's regarded it should be very, very low. But there's been arguments to say that over time, like how property becomes natural, um, how um, um, certain intellectual property goes into public domain, it could it could graduate to a higher tax rate, so that it thus incentivizes the creators and the first supporters of that work. Um, so yeah, there's uh, there's some ideas that I've had around choosing where to pay tax, where it's like opt-in well models for the people involved with it, but um, probably with uh, not in the scope of this talk. But just to specify that there are various ways in which you can think about that, and I think that's an interesting way to say, listen, these are now opt-in models where we say, if we do it this way, it will not only just create better allocation of the in intellectual property, but also support artists and art and creators along the way. And thus, in that way, we can create you know, a more radical market for the arts. And so to end off, I just want to end off with the feeling. Um, this picture right here uh, is one of my favorite pictures to give you an example of what this all means to us and what the arts mean to us. These men are absolutely ecstatic at a brilliant jazz trumpet solo. And we've all been there. We've all cried after a movie. You know, We've all heard a song where we had to just stop, turn everything off and just listen. You know, we've all been read a book, seen a painting, and laughed at a meme, right? So exploring radical markets and arts is not about just supporting the lifestyles of many creators, but it's also saying, what would the world look like when you create more abundance of creativity so we can find that new painting, that new favorite book, a new favorite photograph, a new favorite meme, and ultimately it will create new ways to connect with more people when we feel like it's, it's be becoming increasingly necessary. So thank you. So two minutes for questions. Yeah. That's a very good question. I think th it is somewhat covered in in the book about the question of being able to evaluate it before you do something so there's like the concept of like creating buffer periods where it's like yes you can come and evaluate it in a certain example for a house like you know you're not going to buy a house unless you've seen the house um i think intellectual property might be easier to evaluate it because there's not a lot of it involved it's, it's a it's a complete product um i'm not sure if glenn has additional info yeah Yeah, I think pat patronage is quite interesting because, as you say, like, you know, 
it was interesting when I was in May at the uh, what's the th the theater in New York next to Juilliard. I don't remember. Um, watching ballet, and there was a sign. You could just clearly see, you know, just so many signs of people saying they're the benefactor and the patron, and these are valuable things for people that want to play this game for status. That you can utilize that to fund people to say like, let's open up more opportunities for patronage. That is that is about supporting the art, but also you know allowing the people that have access to to wealth to play their games. You know, so play their games that is benefit for many people. Um, and yes, the liberal radicalism stuff is also super interesting. I think that that is an interesting. Way. I still have like outstanding questions around the identity portion, but I think if people self-organize, it's easier to have identity. Um, one more question, Liv. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a bit harder to reason about it in in like traditional fine art space where you have this exactly the scenarios where art is kept for so long and that the turnover rate is very low, right? Um, I still think it would be interesting to see what it would look like if if there were attacks on those, say, fine art paintings or what or whatever. It is also obviously becomes harder when the incentive is partly to incentivize the creators of the artwork when they are no longer around, right? To where should the tax be going? If it, and it could still be fine in saying like we want to see more fine art in the world. Thus, the tax goes to incentivizing people to produce more artwork, you know, scholarships and so forth. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting question. It's maybe more uh, should think about it more. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it.